And one of the women in the audience was a state senator who's been in office quite some time. And so I said to her, you know, afterwards, tell me, could you explain what difference you see? Oh, she said, it's simple. She said, I think New Hampshire is the only state in the United States which has not cut back higher education funding in the current economic crisis. She said, we've had a tough crisis, but the women said no. I said, well, how did you really do it? She said, well, the women got together across party lines and they said, we've got the votes and we're not cutting higher education. <laughs> and it worked. Now, I know what's happening from the newspapers, at least here in California, and I know what's happening in South Carolina where I live. Because when I came back from that road trip, the headline in the local paper said, higher education in South Carolina cut 38% across the board. So we're looking for different answers, different results on a whole series of priorities. So we have very few places in politics where in fact there is the 30% solution for, of women at the policy tables. Well, what about in philanthropy? 20% women in leadership in nonprofits and foundations on their boards and so forth. 20% and the bigger the you get, the fewer the women. What about in religious organizations? Well, they call that the stained glass ceiling. <laughs> and um, the, the uh, actual religious communities that allow women to play leadership roles, which is clearly not all anyway, but those that do, tell the same story. The larger the church, the less likely the woman's going to be the pastor. Or as the, the minister in our own Unitarian Church in South Carolina says, why do you think there's five women ministers in a town of 12,000 people that doesn't even like women? Things are tough in South Carolina, actually. <laughs> so there's a pattern here. It's true in business. It's true in business, 15% of the corporate board seats of the biggest companies here are held by women, 15%. Beginning to get a picture, 17%, 15%, 20%. It's like we've gone a certain distance, but we're not all of the way. So I believe this country and all around the world, we need more women in leadership. I also know that it's not just going to happen. I told you I have 50 years in the workforce. It hasn't happened yet. So what are we going to do? How are we going to make this change happen? Well, that's why I wrote the book, and I'm traveling around the country. As I said, the book came out in October. This is my 58th book event. Counting the people here today, it's more than 5,000 people that I've talked to personally, as well as through networks like um, like the whip, and I'm doing it because I think we've got to wake up. I think we've got to come together. That in addition to the work we're doing in whatever issue it is that turns us on where we want to change the world, we've got to make sure that we also change who's at the tables making the decisions. So last month I was in London, and uh, my husband's British, you all would like to meet him. This is the first road trip he hasn't been on, so I have to give him a full report when I get back. But London is his home. And uh, so besides the fact that he loved going to the pubs and eating fish and chips and all that kind of thing, we did four events there. And they were so different than what happens most places here. I wanted to spend a minute talking about them. First of all, I spoke in the House of Lords. Now, that is different, let me tell you, uh, about the book. But the most interesting part was that the deputy prime minister, a woman, was the person who responded to the book. She liked it, I should tell you. But, and I thought to myself, the deputy prime minister. And they had a woman prime minister, too. And we still have a third of Americans who don't think a woman could hold any of these positions even though we had a woman in both political parties running. Oh, that was really interesting. Then I did an event with business leaders, and it was half women and half men 
who came to learn more about how to have more women in leadership. Why? Not because they thought it was a, a lovely thing, again, or they just loved women, or they were trying to look good, or whatever. But they had been convinced that, in fact, their companies would be better off if they had more balanced leadership. They had seen some of the studies, like one from France, that showed that the only corollary between those financial institutions that did well in the economic crisis and those that went down were whether they had 30% or more women on their boards of directors. That's smart business, not a special benefit for women. And I learned when I was there that the FTSE 100, which is sort of like our Fortune 100, the biggest companies in, in the UK, have a program where 43 of the male CEOs of those great big corporations are working together to mentor women to be on boards of directors. Not their own board, but just because our country's economy would be better off if we had balanced leadership. So I was pretty blown away, you know. I mean, this was some of this I'd read about, but to see it in person and to hear about it was really something else. But the UK is not alone. There's a lot going on in other places in Europe that we don't hear a great deal about. It's been led by women, but this issue for balanced leadership is not being considered a women's issue. This is an issue for everybody who wants a company better, a country better, solves the problems of the planet, and on and on. So President Sarkozy of France, while I was there, he's a conservative, incidentally, while I was there, announced a program, a, a bill in the parliament, which they have the majority for, and so it will pass, that follows a model that was set in Norway a couple of years ago. In this case, to mandate 40% women on all corporate boards of directors. Can you imagine? How about that? Now, we don't do quotas. We don't do mandates. But there's a lot of things we can do that we're not doing. That model in Norway was also proposed by a conservative member of parliament, a man. And he proposed having 40% women on all the boards of publicly held corporations, or they would lose their public charter to do business, and they had to do it in a very few years. Why? Because he said from the floor of the Norwegian parliament that if we just have the hunting and fishing buddies of the guys who are already there, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> He's right. He's absolutely right. And this model that now has come before the French parliament and has successfully been uh, done in Norway is now the law in Spain and the Netherlands as well. So when you're thinking about what a great job we've done in this country to open up opportunity, there's some people who've got some ideas globally that we really need to think about and to talk about. So this is all about the business case of why it is that we need balanced leadership. And that's actually the first half of the book that you have in front of you, with all the research and all the quotes and so forth that you can find. But that's not the whole story. That's like identifying the problem. When I was done with that part of the book, I was pretty happy. I mean, I'm a policy wonk type person um, who's been a change agent all of her life, and I thought, I've made a really great case. But then I started to think about it, and I thought, well, yeah, but this case has been out there. It's not unique. The corporate women have made it about corporate life. The lawyers about women in law firms as partners. The academics about what's going on. The people in the media. <coughs> so what? What's happened? So the second half of the book, and I think it's probably why I'm really here today, is what can we do about it? What can we do about it individually and together to change this picture? How can we build on the incredible strength and creativity and talent and skills of the women of America to have a stronger economy, 
to have better businesses